So since we're going to dive more into uh, traditional uh, Buddhist teaching today, what I'd like to do is start um, with a, a little bit of opening prayers, if that's okay with you. And so I'm going to recite a prayer, prayers in Tibetan, mostly taking refuge, generating bodhicitta, prayer on the four immeasurables, a mandala offering. So if you know them, feel free to chant along. It's like the, the what do you call it? The greats hitting all the, like one of those albums. <laughs> Buddhist <laughs> prayers to all the greats. <laughs> so if you know the greats, then feel free to join in. Um, or if you don't, um, or you know them in English, you can also chant them in English. And um, either way, you can just kind of like send yourself again through the practice and just um, check in with your motivation for today. And here we're just aligning our motivation with uh, a motivation searching for awakening from a Buddhist perspective, that we're here all together as a community discussing Buddha Dharma um, in the sense of uh, whatever awakening means to us in the moment. I'll explain what Buddhist awakening means throughout the day. But um, just touching into that, that spark that may be um, uh, allowed or inspired you to come today. Yeah? And if you're a Buddhist, you can also take refuge at this point. Sangye Chodan Sangye Chonam La Jan Shu Bardu Dani Kapsu Chi Dai Gi Jin Sangye Pe Sonam Ki Drola Penchir Sangye Drupar Shon Sangye Chodan Sangye Chonam La Jan Shu Bardu Dani Kapsu Chi Dagi Jin Sangye Pe Sonam Ki Drola Penchir Sangye Drupar Shog Sangye Chodan Sangye Chonam La Chan Shu Bardu Dani Kyap Su Chi Dagi Jin Sangye Pe Sonam Ki Drola Penchir Sangye Drupar Shog Sem Chen Tam Che De Wa Dan De We Gyu Da Dram Par Gyu Chi Du Ma Dan Du Nga Ki Gyu Dan Dra Wa Gyu Chi Du Nga Me Pe De Wa Dan Mi Dra Wa Gyu Chi Cha Dan Nerin Dan Dra Wa Tang Nyom Chen Pa La Ne Par Gyu Chi Mandala Afrin Saji Pichu Ju Chi Me To Tram Ri Ra Lin Chi Ni De Gyan Pa Di Sangye Jin Du Mik Te Bo Var Gi Dro Ko Nam Da Shin Na Cho Par Sho Sam Chen Nam Ki Sam Pa Dan Lo Yi Je Tra Chi Ta Var Che Chun Tu Man Te Pa Yi Chokin Kordu Kordu So Hong Morgan Yogan No Jo Sam Pema Gyo Sar Dong Pa La Yom Sen Chukin Kondra Ne Pema Jun Ne Shih So Dra Kodo Kondra Ma Pa Kor Kiki Jis Sa Da Dra Ki Jin Ki Lam Shih Shih So So Guru Pema Siddhi Hong Morgan Yogan No Jo Sam Pema Gyo Sar Dong Pa La Yom Sen Chukin Kondra Ne Pema Jun Ne Shih So Dra Kodo Kondra Ma Pa Kor Kiki Jis Sa Da Dra Ki Jin Ki Lam Shih Shih So So Guru Pema Siddhi Hong Hong Orgi Yuga no cha sam pema gya sar dum bo la yam sen cha ki ngun dru ne pema ju ne shi su tra ku du kan ru man po kur ki ki ji su da ju ki ji ngya lam shi shi su su guru pema si di hong 
Omen Shogi Yinge Boron, Dosom Sange Kunging on Ranson Shogango, Ranson Shokurung on some tons of pounds, so we are Namen Shamla, so the pound and so we are Lama Rimposhe, Takichi or Peme Dan Shoda, Java Mapardo Bosch and Nikan, Kuson Tuking or Drusaldo, so. So today we'll be discussing the Buddhist path and more specifically the mind of awakening or bodhicitta. So here in line with that we're just going to check in with our motivation and also turn our motivation towards the motivation of awakening, so that whatever listening, contemplating, and meditating we do here together becomes a cause for our awakening for the benefit of all sentient beings. So here, those of us who have been studying the Buddhist path, recognizing the faults of samsara, seeing there's nothing reliable within samsara, nothing ultimately reliable. We give up hope in creating some kind of permanent happiness, permanent pleasure, permanent bliss from objects and ways of looking at those objects that don't produce that. And so with this mind of renunciation, we then can see and relate to all sentient beings, recognizing our own suffering in the eyes and faces and lives of others, seeing that just as we go through the ups and downs of life, ultimately not being able to find anything reliable within a dualistic or subject-object framework or samsara, this too goes for all sentient beings. And we're quite fortunate in that we have had access to the Buddha Dharma, practice it, understand it to a certain degree. So within that, we generate not just this wish to be free of samsara, but actually to attain awakening in order to benefit others. So really awakening here becomes almost like the <clears throat> kind of goes to the background and our focus and attention moves more towards how can I help others to awaken to enlightenment from a Buddhist perspective as quickly as possible. And the only answer really we can come to is that how am I supposed to do this when I'm not awakened myself? So we need to become awakened or enlightened. What we'll talk about today, the the path of training in bodhicitta for that. So with that kind of outlook, just looking at the state of the world. Now a lot of people get worked up right now about the state of the world, but just think, you all are smart people. Has the world ever been happy or perfect or not having war or disease or all of that, right? No. So this doesn't lessen our compassion for the times we're going through right now. But we just recognize we're talking about a much bigger picture here. When we think about that, we can start to tie this into those we know who are maybe suffering illness or suffering the effects of oppression, violence, war. And slowly letting more and more beings be encompassed in our attitude. Maybe news stories we heard or read about. And so, well, we develop a wish that they're free from that suffering of this life, that suffering they're going through right now. We start to also develop a wish that they be free from all suffering altogether, which would be awakening or enlightenment. So we wish for both just temporal well-being, but also ultimate well-being or ultimate 
enlightenment from a Buddhist perspective for all beings. So the whole reason we're here today from this perspective or motivation is to grow our own awakened mind to serve others. Yeah? So this is the, the best, most noble motivation within Buddhism. And of course, by the way, our own problems get taken care of. So if you're here and thinking, oh, but what about my problems? Well, they'll get taken care of as well, just as a side effect. But our main motivation is this, serving others, caring for others, awakening others. So try to feel that in your heart, especially with this attitude of compassion, recognizing the pain in the world, both subtle and more obvious. So this is our intention for the day. Actually, this is our intention for life, if, we'd, if we wish it. So thank you. <laughs> um, I'm really interested in the etymology, is it etymology is the right word? Yeah, etymology of um, Sanskrit words. And so Sangha kind of has this more this connotation. The word Sangha also takes on new meanings. And, you know, traditionally it means um, the, the, um, the actual Sangha is like the Sangha of those who've realized emptiness and bodhicitta. So we call it like the Arya Sangha. So not just monastic, but any being who has a stable realization of emptiness. And then the relative Sangha is the the Sangha of monastics, right, of ordained uh, uh, Buddhists. Uh, but the, the word actually, uh, Sangha, means to join or to come together. So it's actually quite a beautiful word, like at its essence, right? And it's sort of, what I've noticed is that, um, you know, for me, I often get stuck in, a, in, a ex, in an expectation or, um, or like an idea of something, but the word to join or come together is an action, right? It's, it's like what we're actually doing rather than what it is or the idea of it. And just that action in itself and coming together, I'm assuming, you know, in the Dharma, right? <laughs> uh, just that action in itself has a quality that helps our practice. That, that's why it being one of the three jewels, right? Coming together in the Dharma. Um, and it makes so much sense to me now why the Buddha had that because... Um, we're communal beings, you know, we're, we're, we, we need intimacy, we need affection, we need connection. And when we're starved of that, things don't flourish, you know. It's hard to develop things like compassion, it's hard to develop things like loving kindness. Um, I, when I was a monk uh, for nine years, a lot of that was spent in solitary retreat, and a lot of that was spent sort of beating my head against the wall, because of sort of trying to develop these things alone. And there, there was some value and, and benefit to that. And in the Buddhist tradition, as you know, we have a lot of that you know, uh, emphasis on solitary retreat and practice and things like that. Uh, but I think specifically for us culturally, because um, most of us coming from, well, most of, most of us in this room coming from uh, European-based uh, cultures and people, those are extremely communal cultures that were that have been divided and picked apart uh, uh, for, you know, over the over the time or generations our ancestors have been in America, where our system's highly individualized now, and um, that's what's prized, right? So it also starts to create a disparateness where that combined with um, a lack of emotional education, where we're not taught emotional intelligence and cognitive intelligence is more uh, sort of prized, right? Because it actually, because it produce, supposedly produces something. Um, then w there's kind of these two aspects where the, the two things that nourished us the most, that tapped us into our innate sense of bodhicitta or innate sense of, uh, my, our teacher Sogh she calls it essence love, as I'm sure you guys have heard that term already, essence love or our innate Buddha nature, uh, slowly kind of we, we become further apart from it because there's, there's these aspects of not being in touch with the body and, and emotions, and at the same time, not having the community, right? And, and being, having the individual more prized. So the reason I'm mentioning these first is I think in a traditional Buddhist talk, we would just start with bodhicitta. We would just start with, right away with, okay, how do we develop compassion, more compassion for others? How do we develop more loving kindness for others? How do we connect that into the mind of awakening, which is also connecting in, into ultimate bodhicitta or emptiness? So how do the, all those connect and 
How do we develop that? We're going to talk about that too. But often as a preliminary for us, and even for those of us who've been practicing for years, um, we have to come to... Someone's coming in. Hi there, come on in. <laughs> we have to um, come to some healing and process of reconnecting to the, uh, the feeling world and, and the emotions, uh, the emotional world in the body, yeah? And also, you know, why I brought up community is, as all of you had said, it's wonderful to come together in the Dharma. There's something nourishing and deeply connective about that because we're not on our own. And then when we pretend we are, we, we think we are, we're taught we are, maybe don't, we don't think that consciously, but we behave that way because we're conditioned through the culture, right, to do that, it further cuts us off from reality because the truth is we're, we're never alone. We're never, meaning we're, we're, we're never, the, the, the illusion that we can do something on our own or even survive on our own, it's just an illusion. There's so many factors and conditions and beings that help us survive. Just the clothes we wear or the food we eat, thousands and thousands of beings, millions possibly, are involved in the production of those, right? Our bodies are produced by our mother and father, you know? Uh, all of that, right? I can go on forever, right? So, so this is, um, so it's not like we know this uh, consciously, like we know this, you know, uh, in, in our thinking mind, but in our bodies, sometimes uh, culturally, we can become disconnected. And that's not for me to judge any of you. That's just for me to put the information out there that it's very common. And then for you to see is that the case? And then we're going to use some practices to reconnect that too. We'll probably spend most of the morning on that. Um, so, you know, just the premise of the talk, um, you know, this idea of, of resilience that I, that I wanted to bring in. So this is the type of, you know, resilience, mainly we talk about resilience in relation to psychology and, and emotions, yeah? And this morning we're going to spend some time on that. Um, but I like to also talk about resilience from a Buddhist perspective and what that means. Uh, because it means really chewing on this first, the first noble truth of the Buddha, chewing on what dukkha, what the Buddha intended by saying no dukkha, right? So the, the Pali word dukkha meaning, it, it, it's hard to translate it directly into English because uh, it, it means both suffering and pain, like the, the, the English word suffering and pain, but it also means like just the subtler forms of dissatisfaction we experience when uh, we get what we want and it changes and we don't like it anymore, or we try to get what we want and we don't get it, right? All the way down to the most subtlest form of dissatisfaction, which is just clinging to a sense of self that is illusory, that is not fixed, not permanent, but a moving phenomena, right? And then building an identity around that. So that's the most subtlest form of dukkha from a Buddhist perspective. And that's what binds us to all the rest of the dukkha. So we'll, we'll get to that later today. But what I want to point out is um, chewing and, and working with this first noble truth of knowing dukkha. I think, especially when we access Tibetan Buddhism, there's so much there's so many things and so many bells and whistles and practices, you know, it's easy to skip over. Like just now, like in the last five years, I've been practicing since uh, about yeah, 17, 18 years, something like that, 20 meditating, but about Buddhism for about 18. Um, just now in the last four or five years, I'm really going back to the Four Noble Truths and really, really getting interested in those and working with those, especially knowing Dukkha. And we're going to see it's, it's almost impossible to develop authentic bodhicitta from a Mayana perspective without really working with the first, the, the first noble truth a lot, like in our practice. Because it's hard, because the resilience here <clears throat> comes from just being honest and seeing what, what really is our circumstance as a human being right now, you know? And most of us, just from the looks of it, are, are and I don't want to assume, but are you know in pretty good circumstances uh, for, for being a human being these days. Um, but even within that, even within very good circumstances, right? All chewing on, bring, you know, reflecting on, contemplating all of the different kinds and levels of suffering we go through, right? So this isn't done in a way to depress us or uh, discourage us or to focus on, you know, dwell on suffering. It's really meant to wake us up, right? So I, I know when, when I'm sick, and you know, you know that time right when you're about to get a cold, and you, you don't know, it's kind of in, it could just be like you didn't sleep, and you know, there's some weird thing coming through your body, or, or you're about to get sick, or a flu, or something. 
I have a lot of denial in that period, <laughs> you know, of like, no, I'm not getting sick, I'm not going to do it, you know, thinking that if I, the more I think, the, less, the more I deny, I won't get sick, right? Uh, but then eventually I have to come to accept it at some point, right? And I have to come to be with just being honest, okay, I'm getting a cold for the next week or whatever, I'm going to have to deal with this. So <clears throat> this is really that process, and it's not, you know, it's not uh, personal in the way of like, like a lot of this where we, we identify because it's so much wrapped in our experience. But it's just, you know, there's one phrase, a, a teacher, I forget the teacher who said this, but um, I really like it, where when we're chewing on dukkha, we can recognize this is hap happening to me, right? So it's more like, okay, this is happening. This is part of my experience rather than this is me. You know, a lot of times we get so caught up when everything becomes so identified, right? So in bodhicitta and all these principles, we're also working to disidentify from some of these things. Not so we have a coldness or an aloofness, but so we can actually relate to things how they are. Yeah, full stop, right? Because we get caught up in an identity with, with these things. We get caught up in, oh, my compassion or my loving kindness or my lack of loving kindness or my lack of compassion, right? Whether it be for ourselves or others. But the truth is that's all wrapped up in an identity that is built in the mind that is constructed, right? So this is where ultimate, what we call ultimate and relative bodhicitta meet. So resilience for me really has this aspect, and then bodhicitta, it's a different kind of resilience because we are working with um, how we recover from a challenging or adverse experience by we're not, fo we're, we're not just, we're not focusing on ourselves as much. Bodhicitta then starts to, just our attitude becomes much more concerned with others. So like the Dalai Lama had a story where he was driving, um, I think from, from, from or to Bodh Gaya for uh, some teachings he had to be at. And he drove by like, um, you know, really, uh, how many, has anybody been to India? I'm guessing quite a few, yeah. So when you go to India and places like that, you just see really, really heart-wrenching, you know, um, experiences of just, you know, really people in the circumstances you couldn't even imagine being in, right? And so he sees uh, a beggar just really, really, you know, destitute, probably, um, what do they have it when they, is it, um, not leprosy, but maybe polio or when the limbs are really deformed, mm -hmm. that, that kind of, anyways. So he had, a, at, the, at that time, the Dalai Lama had like a, like a um, kidney stones or like a gallbladder infection, something really painful, and he was in a lot of physical pain. And he noticed that when he, when he saw this person, a lot of compassion arose for them, just, just bearing witness to their pain with them, wishing them freedom from that pain, right? And um, <clears throat> immediately he noticed, like two minutes later, he said, oh, where did my, my, his pain came back. And he said, where did it go? And you notice that it's just the focus went off of himself. The focus went on to another, right? And so this is the principle within bodhicitta we're working with, which also lessens our attachment to self. A self that, by the way, is a conditioned, impermanent, you know, not fixable phenomena from a Buddhist perspective. And so, I, you know, so we get out of our identity, right, into maybe bringing us closer to an experience of emptiness or shunyata, something that will free us. Um, so this is the kind of practice or, or working with resilience from, from the perspective of bodhicitta. But at the same time, this can also become a giant spiritual bypass if we don't know how to be with our own experience, right? So a lot of us want to reach out to others. We want to uh, grow our compassion, our love, our connection uh, with others. But oftentimes, we don't know how to also care for ourselves. So like I said, traditionally, but the, it would just start here. You know, it would just start with traditional, talking about how to grow more compassion, uh, more loving kindness, more bodhicitta for others, that mind of awakening, to wish for enlightenment for the benefit of others, to engage in the six paramitas. It would start with all that. But culturally, what, what um, you know, our teacher, Sognarim Shays, found, and, and um, I, I agree with him <laughs> like a lot, just due to my own experience, is that um, unless we have enough uh, well-being within us, it's very easy to just bypass into these things. And then we have like kind of a hollowness or a hole within us. And, um, and then it can seem like there's this aspect of, oh, like we're acting like a bodhisattva or we're engaging in, you know, 
bodhicitta activities, but there's no sort of ease here, right? So first, what I want to talk about this morning is how to come into uh, like groundedness in the body. Just being able to be with, with our challenging experiences, being able to find resilience from being in the body uh, with whatever is happening, without trying to fix it, change it, adjust it, uh, uh, manipulate it in any kind of way. Yeah. So for me personally, I found, um, you know, and, and we're going to have a range in this room, right? I'm not saying all of you are experiencing this, but it's just something for you to check individually. Uh, for me personally, you know, after practicing for maybe, yeah, 10 years and being a, a monk for a few of those years, just recognizing, wow, I really don't know how to relate to, my, to like when a difficult emotion comes up because my, my first response is to suppress it or reject it. Um, or, you know, try to suppress or reject it through analyzing it or figuring it out. So, you know, I'm a very analytical person. So then that can be a way to bypass my experience. And, you know, Sokhna Rinpoche, our teacher, he could see right away, you know, okay, you, you need to go back and do this work, right? And so, like I said, this is just um, some cultural work we need to do. So, um, so this is really... Also, he calls it a, a preliminary. So it's really a preliminary to the preliminaries. So our preliminary culturally is sort of learning to be with our experience in the body, being with the feeling world, and then an, an emotional intelligence can start to come out of that, right? Rather than the thinking mind trying to figure out the experience. So I'm going to introduce a practice and then it will make more sense. Because um, So this is a practice... Um, uh, Rinpoche calls uh, handshaking practice. So probably a lot of you know this already. Maybe Sally's introduced it. I'm not sure. But anyways, <laughs> so we'll do a little bit together and, um, and then we'll go from there. If that sounds good. Yeah. So you could just find your seat. Find this is a posture that's comfortable yet relaxed. We're just going to start with a few cleansing breaths just to bring us into the body. So all together we're going to start just breathing in through the nose deeply. Taking a long inhale. And then breathing out through the mouth. Just letting it all out. And again, breathing in through the nose. Breathing out through the mouth. And one more time, breathing in through the nose. Breathing out through the mouth. As we exhale, we just drop the thinking in mind into the body. So here this means we start by just feeling the contents of the body. Letting our awareness just come into contact with whatever wants to be heard right now, something that is maybe the loudest voice right now. So here a voice being something in the feeling world, could be a physical sensation, could be an emotion, a feeling tone or mood, or it, just, or it could just be an energetic resonance in the body that you can't quite name but something that's there. So often, there's a physical sensation connected to an energy. So you don't have to go looking for it, but you just let the awareness rest in the body. And we wait with the body. We wait with the feeling world without an agenda. Without suppressing our experience, without indulging it, without running away from it. So sometimes when we touch in with the body in this way, there can be 
a feeling of vulnerability, maybe a tension or anxiety as a buzz in the body. Some kind of feeling of unease. Or there can be a neutral or pleasant feeling. It's not always uncomfortable. And if we're not able to touch in with anything, just continue to be with the body in this way, especially the area between the belly and chest. And again, we're not looking for anything in particular. We're just being with our experience, similar to how we started the day. Whatever wants to be heard within that experience will come out of that allowing. So we're just leaving the space, the allowing for whatever wants to be heard to be heard, felt with awareness. So, so much of our relationship to emotions and uncomfortable energies and experiences in the body is to resist them, to avoid, to put up walls where we don't have to feel them or be with them. Here we're just simply bringing our awareness to experience. And we're not going to suppress it. We're not going to indulge in it because our awareness is with it. We're not going to run away and we're also not going to apply some kind of agenda or mechanism of control to figure it out or to manipulate it in some way. So we need a little bit of courage here a little bit of guts to face, maybe something that's not so comfortable. So for me, when I often check in with the body, there's usually a, a buzz, sense of anxiety. So I just touch that anxiety I don't try to push into it or push it around, but just <clears throat> bring the awareness to just being with it. And then I wait. If it wants to open, that's fine. If it wants to shift, that's fine. If it doesn't, that's also fine. <clears throat> The main key here is that we're offering compassion <clears throat> to the emotion or feeling in the form of non-judgment and in the form of allowing, just being with the experience. So when you notice that you get caught in a story about it or the thinking mind is trying to analyze or figure it out or trying to solve it, just drop the thinking mind into the body and feel over and over. And if there's not much coming up right now, that's okay too. Just be with your experience in the space of allowing quality of openness, that whatever wants to arise can arise. Or if nothing wants to arise, that's fine too. 
We're never not without experience either. There's always something. Here, the essence of this practice is one hand, the hand of awareness, just gently shaking, coming into contact with the feeling world. Be it a physical sensation, an emotion or mood, or an energy in the body. And here as we wait with experience, when we give enough space, sometimes things start to come out. Things that maybe we weren't leaving space for or we're distracting ourselves from unconsciously, or perhaps things we've suppressed. And if we've Suppressed a lot, there can also be a numbness or feeling like a blockage in the energy body. We can also just feel that, feel the numbness, feel the block, be with that. And we just continue to drop into the body. Just bringing that courage if we've managed to hit something vulnerable or uncomfortable. We don't have to push it around or try to dive right deep into the middle of it. Just be with whatever layer of it it wants you to know right now. It wants you to feel or hear. Usually when we hit a wound in the body, a wound in the emotional body, it has many layers to it. So all we can do here is just come into contact with whatever layer is present right now. We don't peel the layer. We let the layer peel itself. We just bear witness to that and feel it. Some of you may start to notice when we let go in this kind of way, when we let be, offering kindness in the form of non-judgment towards our emotions and feeling world. Also kindness in the form of awareness towards ourself or we're being aware of the experience, fully feeling it. You start to notice the body starts to calm. That tension and resistance that we've been holding in a part of the body unconsciously can release. If you're not there yet, that's fine too. 
especially if you manage to touch something that's a wound in the emotional body. This can take time. And really the practice here is to just be with that experience without running away, without suppressing or indulging it, without trying to change or manipulate or apply some kind of agenda to it. So here as we drop our expectations around the practice, just the aspect of not applying an agenda and being with it in this kind of way can be a huge new habit to develop. It can take time. So we're not searching for healing or calmness or release, but through this practice, we may come to that experience. We may start to touch in with our own innate quality of essence love or just the feeling of okayness that's not conditioned by an outside phenomena. Just a sense of inner well-being that's not really a big deal. What uh, our teacher Sognarim she often calls happy for no reason. But here we have to go through in order to open up. We can't take any shortcuts. We can't think our way out of it. We just have to take the time to be in this kind of way. So it is a very simple practice, but often it's very challenging. Like I said, many of us are not taught how to be with our emotions in this way. When we emphasize the cognitive mind so much, the thinking analytical mind, and we problem solve from that mind, which has more of a linearity to it, there's a logical process usually. When you try to apply that to the feeling world, it just doesn't work. It ends up suppressing feelings or overly analytical processes towards feelings. And the feeling world is not so linear. The feeling world also needs to be felt. So as we connect more with our own innate sense of well-being, this is connected into what eventually expresses itself as bodhicitta, loving kindness and compassion for others. But we can't bypass the work we need to do. So often we seek out methods of resilience that are going to be some magic pill or magic bullet to somehow feel perfect and okay and happy forever. But that's just not the case. Our humanness
needs to be felt, related to, accepted, allowed. Like I started the day off with today, we need to just be honest with what's really going on with us. But honest in the feeling body, not just the thinking mind. So knowing suffering, knowing dukkha here, starts with knowing our own dukkha in the body. Here we start to chew on our experience by being with it without an agenda. We learn from it by just opening and surrendering and allowing into it. But we don't dwell or ruminate. Because our awareness is there just with the experience. We're also not dissociating with that awareness. We are feeling it. So unfortunately, there's no quick way around this or shortcut. Whatever we need to move through, we need to just let it move in its own time, in its own way, through fully being with it. So just as we close the practice, Just know that you can come back to this feeling, whatever you've been working with, any time when it's arising in this kind of way. Things also don't necessarily solve so quickly, depending on what kind of wound we hit. This can be multi-layered things that we need to constantly come back to and just be with in this kind of way. Not with an agenda of fixing them, but with an agenda of bearing witness, compassion, being willing to be with them. Sometimes I feel like it's very similar to being with a very small child and you're just with them in the same space. If they want to play, they can play. If they want to jump and shout, they can do that. If they want to throw a tantrum, they can do that. But we're in a room with them. We just hold the space. Sometimes we need to hold their hand. Sometimes we need to just stay silent and be with. But whatever we do, we're not manipulating We're trying to control them. So when you like, feel free to open your eyes and just coming back back into the room, maybe coming just back into your greater physical body, just feeling your feet touching the earth. 